Hi there and welcome to Crossing the Line Podcast. We are your hosts here today, Charlie Collica and Jim Freak and film buff Oliver Rednell. <laughs> yeah. Hello there. Hello. There we go. Welcome. And uh, joining us today, Ollie, do you want to introduce him? We do. We have a man here who's of many talents. He has appeared in King Arthur as a body double. Is that right? That is correct. That's right. And he has worked as a production assistant on Mowgli, Wonder Woman um, 1984, Black Widow and Solo. And more recently as assistant to the second unit producer on the new Bond film. Louis Taylor Bags, welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks for, coming for coming in. in. Thank you. So, uh, well done for all those titles Thanks there. Thanks so Learnt indeed. like yeah, lines. Been, uh, been up, I've been up all night. Are. Been up all very night. good. <laughs> so, um, Louis, how's it all going at the moment? Yeah, good, thanks. Yeah, very yeah. good. You've just wrapped on b- Bond. Yep, wrapped on Bond. Just As the name's out now, isn't it? No Time to Die. No Time to Die. I think last time I saw you, it wasn't out, and you were just like Bond, Bond yeah. 25, is we've it? Announced 25? The, we've announced the singer for the for the theme tune as well. Yeah, that's great. How, how are you feeling about that? Yeah, pretty good. good. Yeah, good. Yeah. And will that be released as a before the film, or is it w- it's going to no, be released we'll alongside well. the film? Yeah. yeah. That's great. And wh- how long ago does that get decided, or has it been something, or do you not know? To be honest with you, no idea. No but idea. the the producers on that will, you know, Barbara, et cetera, mm-hmm. um, will be to start making those decisions probably very early on. Yeah. Um, and obviously keeping it incredibly mm-hmm. secret. Mm. Um, you know, it, it's a that's a big, big decision. Working on a Bond film, obviously Barbara Broccoli's the daughter of Cubby Broccoli, who was the producer ever since its sort of birth. How does it feel working on a sort of family run film as opposed to working on something like uh, for um, Warner Brothers like um, Wonder Woman does yeah. it have a different tone to it does it different feel like the different kind of decisions that are made obviously you're aware you know when you walk down the corridor and Barbara walks the other yeah. way it's it's a, a big deal and she's a she's an amazing amazing producer um, but really it's it's a very similar feeling you know the, the films both have the same both you know if you work on a Warner Brothers film or you know Eon and MGM and Universal are doing Bond, and so they are ultimately responsible to for the production. So they'll it feels the same, really. You know, it's they're both big movies. They're both traveling around the world, um, and they're both have in incredibly excessive budgets. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So on Mowgli, obviously that's an animated, generally an animated picture. How, what was your uh, role on that compared to the other the other ones, which are live action? Yeah. So Mowgli was the second film that I ever did, and I did a digital photography on that, um, and. I was a production assistant, so I was working in the production office um, with the sort of production coordinator, assistant production coordinator, uh, and essentially the role is to assist with the production of the film on different levels. So the production coordinator will do all sort of visas and camera hires and all that sort of stuff, and then the responsibilities as they sort of they'll get distributed out throughout the production office. But you know, my responsibilities were much smaller than the coordinators. Mm-hmm. So I just help with anything I can, really paperwork and uh, POs, uh, all that sort of thing, just to in- make the film run as smoothly as possible mm-hmm. from that side. You know, it's not hugely creative, um, but it's fascinating. I absolutely loved it um, because I got to meet every department. I got to speak with every person. I, I learned the film from the bottom up. You know, I, I met everybody. Um, and that's how I built my contacts um, and just use that to my advantage you know be green and be interested uh, at that in that early parts of your career because those that that's the time you can get away with asking questions and what 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 was your first thing that you did the first film i ever did was king arthur legend of the sword with guy ritchie as director and the famous david beckham that's uh, that and that's the one you doubled on that's the one tell I us about on. that you were directed yeah. by guy ritchie i was it was completely bizarre i um this must have been my second week in the film industry ever, just out of um, school, and so you tra- you trained as a production assistant. No, really? so I, I was as, as in as in proper school, right? Literal school, yeah. yeah. And I, I did go to university. Uh, I studied film at, at Reading University, but I I kind of straddled the, the the work and the university. At no point really was I studying it at uni. I tried to do them both at the same time. Mm-hmm. So it was going to work in the morning, working at, on a film in the studio. And then writing my essays in the and evenings. producing your own stuff. And when my own Louis stuff. and I worked together on a short called "Do No Harm," we were at Reading shooting on location, and <laughs> you were away in class or whatever it was, and on I had to Friday. come. Yeah, that's it. So, yeah. so you were you were busy doing everything at that time. Yeah, "Do No Harm." Yeah, well, that was exactly. And 
we shot at Reading there and we used some of their s- their sort of sound stages and uh, some of their exterior locations to double as a hospital and mm-hmm. that film's doing really well mm-hmm. at the moment. It's um just about to come out on Shorts International, which is a big American, f- basically Netflix but for short films, um, and Amazon Prime uh, in a few weeks' time. So that's um, amazing. Yeah, so we're d- we're really th- we're really happy with that and that it's got won so many awards and especially if you read up about some of the reviews we've had, Ollie gets a very very yeah, good write-up. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Modesty yeah. rife in this room. Whatever, whatever, whatever. whatever. <laughs> um, so you say you work on additional addig- additional photography on uh, Mowgli. What is that? So, so is that when they do like reshoots or they need something extra for people who don't know, obviously, who aren't in the industry? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so that's basically the time. So films will... So either they'll schedule additional photography into their into their budgets they'll plan to do it because a lot of the time it's nice if you've got the luxury and the money it's nice to do a first cut and then think oh it'd be really great if we had this or that or that doesn't quite work that doesn't because the work. story has actually changed since yeah, we filmed that thing. exactly so and you know this maybe this bit could be more clear if we shot this or, or we did that so a lot of the time that that happens but also Sometimes it's unplanned additional photography and mm. you get to the end of a film and you, you start doing your focus screenings and the, the feedback comes in and it's, you know, pretty drastic and it's negative and you have to, you're forced into going out and changing it. Well, you hear films, uh, so Justice League was one movie that, uh, and I, I, I kind of mentioned that as you've been working on Wonder Woman. Yes. Um, I imagine the trajectory of the DCEU has, like, changed rapidly because of how justice league was taken so wonder woman i imagine is becoming very forefront while something like batman we know that robert pattinson is doing it but that's its own thing now isn't it it's not actually part of the yeah uh story so uh kind of going back to what you were saying before how does something which is a shared universe uh big billion dollar uh money maker like that how does that affect your job um, especially when it comes to things like reshoots, because you might have something really good, but then you find out that, oh no, it turns out an Aquaman, Wonder Woman's got to have this thing, so uh, we've got to redo this entire thing and I- input this. Yeah, I mean, f- f- for me as a production assistant and um, director's assistant, uh, as I am at the moment, you know, I'm, f- I'm freelance, so I do I do the jobs that come up. At the moment, for me, there's not a huge amount of sort of considering um interrelated universes and also you know i'm just going to take the job that i get offered you know i can't at this stage afford to be picky maybe later in my career once i've progressed to a producer i will have my own style of films i'd like love to do and make and i hopefully won't stray beyond that um but when you're making a film like that like a sort of a, a big warner brothers you know dc universe sort of film there does feel like quite a lot of pressure because obviously you've got millions of fans out there that that know the story in inside and out. Mm. Um, and there are certain continuity things that have to happen for it to all make sense. Um, but luckily that, again, doesn't fall on my shoulders, f- um, that responsibility, thankfully. Just yet. Just yet, yeah. 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 So, uh, I mean, obviously we'll ha- we'd have a script supervisor on set who is responsible for reading the script, making sure the actors get their lines right, you know, is that coffee cup in the right place? Were they holding it? What, at what point in is the... Is that continuity? Yeah, uh, sp- yeah, continuity. They take pictures, don't they, as take well? Take pictures underneath. of everything. Yeah. But then that's an also shared role with the art department, the greens department. So the art department will take pictures of what they dress, the greens department will take pictures of what they dress, you know. On Bond that I just did, I was... Because Alexander Witt, the second director that I worked for, um, he was not only the director, but he was also the director of photography. So, um, for I the whole film or just for the second unit? Just for the second unit, okay. yeah. So, um, I was then doing lighting plans. So, we'd, we'd, we'd map out exactly what lights we'd had on in what scene and scene number. And some of these sets have got hundreds of practical lights, and everyone has to be marked down for on or off. Um, it sounds like a battle plan. Or something oh yeah, like I that. mean it's 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 extraordinary. Um, and you know you, you've got different types of big lights. You know, you've got 10Ks, you've got Dinos, you've got all these different lights that are all with di- they all have different filters on. Was them. it LED you were using? Yeah, yeah. Look, I mean every sort yeah. of light you can possibly think of was we had at at, at some point or another. Um, so there's there's a huge amount of making sure that if for for some reason someone had to come back in six months time and shoot reshoot what we'd done they had a continuity folder full of art department greens lighting plans all these 
notes. So they can reset the room. So they can exactly reset the room exactly how to was. how it was. Yeah. And that helps with sequels as well because they then have everything they could possibly need. If yeah, they and need to do like flashbacks or something. Yeah, yeah and like if that. they've got a different um, team or someone else working, exactly. they can it could be it a completely up. different crew. You know, hundreds of different people that have never worked on this film before, and we have to make sure that if they pick up that folder, they can shoot the exact thing we did. Mm-hmm. So does that mean like a certain film will have hundreds of ring binders for like each oh. individual scene, even ones that weren't necessarily used in the final cut? Yeah, something? yeah. I mean, there's exactly. I mean, uh, we're trying to step away from ring binders nowadays, and you know, yeah, digital, green initiatives. Kind of, yeah. So we're going digital with a lot of things. But um, yeah, I mean, the amount of continuity stuff that we'll have for f- for stuff that wasn't e- didn't even end up in the film. Yeah, absolutely. There's scenes we shoot whole scenes that don't end up in movies. Um, I think I heard it from a guy on, on Solo. He did six weeks, and he didn't appear in any of it. Yeah. They, they shot something like three films worth of material. Yeah, would you say that's probably true? Well, I mean, I ob- worked on it. Obviously, the with Solo, it's, it, the added complication is that we had two directors, Phil mm-hmm. and Chris, and then they stepped away from the project, and we had uh, Ron Howard come in and take over. So there's a, you know, and Ron Howard got the got the the final director credit. So there is a certain amount of I think I'm right in saying this, that you have to reshoot at least 50% of the film as a new coming in director in order to, to be credited, credited as the sole director. I think that's the same for writing as well, isn't it? You know, if you Well, a lot of writers will be on, on films but won't even get credited. They'll have, um, what do they call them? Like the script doctors and things like that that come Polishers up. and all that kind of thing. Yeah, that, w- that we're happy to take. And even producers sometimes, they won't always get credited, will they? No, yeah, the script sort of editors, you know, if someone hasn't written the full script, but they might come in and write a couple of, you know, a couple of scenes or change some bits around, they might get a script editor credit instead. Mm. Um, yeah. But working on the second unit, for people who who are watching who, who don't know the difference, could you s- explain the difference between the first unit and the second unit? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so that... So they're called different things, main, first unit, or second, and action unit. So there's, And there's also a splinter unit or a third unit, and they're called different things around the world. But ultimately, f- main unit will do um, the scenes where you have character and actor interaction. So where there are conversations, like you and I talking now, this would be shot by the main unit. And then the moment that someone broke through the window behind us and started shooting a gun at us and we had to get up and escape and run away, that would then change to the second or action unit. So that's what I did on Bond. So we would be responsible for the stunts, the explosions, the car chases, the action. Um, whereas so the, the more kind of rough and ready... Yeah. Um, or the ones that you have, m- have to improvise for more? Well, I, don't I know. mean, there's a lot of danger involved with the stuff that we do. So there's a huge amount of planning. Yeah. So, you know, we go... For on Bond all around the world and we, we are planning everything to a T. You know, our first AD, our stunt coordinator, our uh, our director are working <coughs> around the clock to make sure that everyone is safe. So does the second unit do... Uh, th- I don't know how to say this properly. Do they do more work then or is it just different work? It's to just what different the first work. Yeah. And, and also, you know, different films and different budgets will, will have different things. You know, a second unit on a, on a film with a smaller budget with not mer- very much action will do what a, th- a sprint unit would do on a bigger film with more money if that makes sense mm. you know the sprint unit will do inserty bits and like traffic know. or something or a london bus going yeah. by before we cut something like that maybe yeah, and hands planning on the piano yeah. and all that sort of thing uh, um but a something on a big do that on a smaller film something on a big special effects picture then something like a dc that's obviously a lot of action will that be the main unit doing that or obviously a lot's done in post i remember i heard robert Down- downey jr say that something like he moved his arm and he's like, oh, I never did that. They just put that in later on because I, I forgot to do it during the take or something like that. Would that be done by the principal the pr- principal photography, like the main unit? Uh, pr- yeah, so um, so basically we you know we have loads of body doubles, action, action, ac- action, stunt, uh, stunt doubles. doubles yeah. Yeah. So they will, they will come on and they will do, they'll learn the movement of the, of the actor that they're impersonating. They'll do all those things. And so a lot of the time, probably for an actor, it's quite strange because they'll see uh, themselves doing all this stuff on screen that they've never did or don't re- remember doing. Mm. Um, and that's probably quite hard sometimes to spot for them what bits they did do and what bits they didn't do. But nine times out of ten, the principal actor won't be doing what 
they're doing on screen. In terms unless of you're action. Tom Cruise. Unless you're Tom Cruise. In Tom which Cruise case, he attaches himself to the side of a plane and yeah, you go, please don't die. Pretty <laughs> amazing <laughs> stuff he does. Yeah. Yeah, and that, this Top Gun film that's coming out, that looks Top Gun Maverick. Oh, I imagine he's on. done everything. Yeah, and they, well, they yeah. shot, I think, in, in real planes, didn't they? Real jump mm, yeah. um, fighter jets. <laughs> yeah. Hurricanes or something like that. So no, 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 no. No, no, no. The American planes, I think. No, I don't know anything about planes. Hurricanes is like a 1940... 40s Battle Typhoon? of Britain. Watch out, we've got uh, all anyway, all all no, I don't know. I'm just, uh, I'm just imagining. <laughs> no, but um, he's just shooting me down. Yeah. yeah. yeah oh, yeah, see what you did there. See what you did there. Um, but so on the second unit, that's how bloody much brilliant. Though. <laughs> Sorry. On, <laughs> on, on a Bond film, on a Bond film, what sort of percentage? Because obviously, there's a lot of action in the Bond film. Mm. And but the director, how much will the the main director? So is Kerry. Um, yeah, Kerry Fukunaga. He, how much will he have to say over the second unit? Will he advise saying it needs to be like this, or actually could we try like this? And then the second unit director, Rem- Gary Alexander, a- Alex, yeah, he, he, um, he will then take note of that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, de- I mean, ultimately, Car- it's Carrie's film. You know, he he is the director, and he, um, but saying that you know alexander knows who's second unit director knows his the way to direct action you know that's his speciality that is his 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 job you know he is the best you can get at, at directing action which is why they hire him to do the action so the main unit director and the second unit director will talk almost every day and uh, on every film you know not just bond they will talk and they will discuss what they want and they will translate their ideas and they will talk about how to achieve them and then the second unit will go out and shoot it um, if we have time in the schedule, <coughs> uh, the director might look at the rushes and and give some notes. If we're going to go back to that same location the next day, um, if if we don't, then you know, that's a conversation for the producers to have. Mm. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, that that was quite a traditional way that it would would work, and it's changing a bit now because of mobile phones and sort of communication is so much easier. So, y- you know, we can sit on a set in south america and send videos to whoever we need to around the world for approval if we want to um not saying that maybe that's always the best way to do things but it is possible now you know a director main unit director could review footage just after it's been shot um so that is something to always think about and was that something that would happen on something like Bond, for instance like is you said is you mentioned barbara Bro- broccoli quite a lot is she one of those that's constantly on set or is she like uh kind of having it live streamed to her um barbara barbara is she's sort of on on set off set she's sort of everywhere really Mm. she 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 does she knows everyone's name she's a she's a really brilliant producer um i had a a question about that as well you 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 mentioned a couple of times that she's a brilliant producer and i've no doubt she is yeah um what makes a brilliant producer in your mind well in my head, a, a brilliant producer is is because obviously I, I myself I do I'm a bit a of pr- producer, producing. Yeah. <laughs> my, you know, I try and emulate some of these characteristics that I see on set. You know, that's why I've started doing all this production assistant and direct assistant work because I want to learn from the people that make the big movies in order for myself to go on and make the big movies I- as well one day, mm. hopefully. Um, and I I I practice my my producing through Crunchy Tomatoes so I've made a few short films I do know half mm-hmm. um, so I always try and have open channels of communication between the cast the the director the producer everyone needs to know exactly you know what we're doing if 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 there isn't a conversation happening between director and producer then that's already a in my head a, a red a, flag a red flag because y- you need to have you know n- Obviously, creativity is super important, but so is the budget, you know. Um, So there needs to be an understanding on both sides of what we're trying to achieve and how we're going to achieve it. Um, Actors need as much, you know, actors and everyone involved need as much prep time as possible. Rehearsals, script writing, locking the storyboards, locking the, you know, all of that stuff is how, you know, it's impossible to make a movie efficiently if you don't have those things in place to begin with so it's a producer's job to make sure they are there ready to go you know when we need that script and that bit for that scene it's there and we can look at it um they're just it's it's an incredibly tricky job the the job of a producer um thinking about everything they go from state stage one to the right to the end of the movie t- to release and distribution um so trying to maintain that attention to detail 
for you know two years, three years maybe, uh, is tricky. You know, do no harm. We've we've shot that uh, I two, don't years know, two years ago. Two years ago, and obviously, I was on that in pr- pre-production for well, six we met months. in September, October the year before. Yeah, so uh, two and a half years ago, essentially. Well, what was that? Twelve-minute film, 13, 14 yeah, minute film. Twelve-minute, fifty-three-second film, yeah, and go. and it's precise. Can we check <laughs> that? <laughs> just yeah, it's good. Like, can we just, <laughs> I'll just pull that up on IMDb. Yeah. Yeah. I know, can you tell that I've been doing it for yeah. a long time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that, and then we're still, you know, doing it. I'm t- today, it still takes up a large portion of my day, um, sitting down and putting it into film festivals and replying to emails from people like Shorts International and and getting it. You know, ultimately, uh, my goal is to get the film watched by as many people as possible. Um, so that is still something I'm battling with today. Alongside other projects, like we did music videos, yeah, now your music production videos, team doing we're that. Yeah, doing all those, which is great. Mm-hmm. You know, I, you know, short films, music videos, they br- they're brilliant. Sh- music videos are a great place to sort of try out things that I, later we're then going to take into short films, feature films. You know, it's a great sandbox of creativity and testing and trialing stuff out mm. for us as a production company i mean a, a lot of directors like ridley scott start out in commercials i think david fincher did commercials and some music videos as well yeah. so i think they still do them though don't yeah they? you're probably right with some big big brands and things yeah like they that. do a lot yeah. of short films as well actually. yeah the, you know, a lot of those big guys still mm. come david out. lynch is just done for netflix isn't yeah, yeah exactly he's released that yeah, I saw that the other day. Was it good? I haven't watched it, but I saw that. It oh was right, <laughs> you saw it. You <laughs> saw that it was on. No, yeah. no, I saw the news that had come out, that which yeah. was really interesting. Yeah, you know, amazing that they still. Is there still market the for them? Definitely, and I suppose with people in their, um, you know, short attention spans and and li- busy lives, short films are maybe making a more of a more of a mainstream yeah. uh, a mainstream thing. Yeah, it's in, yeah, because obviously you know you've got people that double screen nowadays. You know, you, you not many people can watch a whole movie without checking their phone. No, it's that's sad right. reality. And do we then have to adapt what we create to to meet that, or do we just deny it and mm. ca- continue the way we are? Mm. Um, so that's something that I'm you know interests me as well. How much do we adapt to technology changing as a movie industry and, and as Hollywood? You know, Hollywood. Um, so, so, so go on. Th- I was going to say, um, uh, y- me, uh, y- y- working on uh, Crunchy Tomatoes, your production company. What is the kind of thing that you want to get into? If you, so Guy Ritchie obviously has his kind of way of making movies. Barbara Broccoli. Has yeah, you hers. spoke about the genre you don't want to stray too far from in the future. What is that? Well, I think it's probably, you know, it sounds sounds ridiculous, but it's <coughs> real real films and good films now a lot of people there's a big argument whether or not you know mcu films are are films and whether or not these big hollywood franchises are actually films and i think you know if you approach them in the right way and make them in the right way they can be you know for example dc you know they've they've taken a bit of slack over the last few years for the way they've made their films but they've then released joker which has been, you know, a masterclass and of filmmaking. And winning awards, winning awards all over the world, mm-hmm. you know, and, and that is a DC film. It's made by a DC Warner Brothers company, and so they've. That's sort of an example of what I mean: is that you can still make these massive, you know, movies, but make them in a way that still is filmmaking, a proper locations, acting, art. Do you think that is uh, mentioning Joker there? Do you think that is in part to do with? not being constrained by the wider DCEU picture because that is by that is a story by itself and I think that's kind of how it was sold to Joaquin Phoenix as well. Yeah, a story by itself, but then someone's made that decision somewhere along the line to not just do sort of an origin Batman versus Superman. You know, yeah. they've made the decision that we're gonna stylistically change the way this movie looks um and feels. And whoever made that decision has really hit the hit the jackpot. You know, that, that film is brilliant. Um and so that's the sort of film that I'm interested in, but also middle, middle, middle budget movies like My Week with Marilyn and and all the you know, Saving Mr. Banks and Inglorious Bastards and you know, f- films on location, films shot on location on real cameras. Would Inglorious Bastards count as a middle? Uh, well, budget wise, it hasn't got you know planes coming in and blowing a city up kind of thing, is it? It's a real character driven. It's quite. Well, I, I suppose you've got the part where they blow up the cinema. At yeah, the but what's that? A few barrels of, or, you know, it's nothing compared to a Bond film when they're yeah, I crashing not. a plane yeah, yeah. into a, yeah, I mean a field or something. Yeah, it sounds ridiculous, but I guess in in the sort of Hollywood world, they talk about budgets in a very loose sense. You know, middle budget to them is like you know anything from a hundred million. Yeah, to around hundred million mark. Yeah. you know, high budget is 
three to four hundred million yeah. low budgets under thirty. You know, and obviously to us that's it's like a stupid ridiculous numbers, ridiculous amount of money. Yeah. But to them, that's that's the sort of the scale they use, and that is you know, it's it's crazy to <laughs> me when you know I think about the the film short films we make for a, a shoestring. Um, but yeah, that's the reality. That's just life. You have to crack on with what you got. Absolutely. Yeah. I had a question. But I've completely forgotten it. It's because I interrupted you, you did. wasn't it? Yeah, <laughs> Stop I'm, it. A, I'm a monster. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. I'll just sit over here and say nothing. So, um, b- between um, production assistant and now director's assistant, how did you step into that role? Uh, well, firstly, how did you get into a production assistant role? And then how did you progress through into the role that you're in now? Is it something you you would continue to do as a production assistant, or are you now freelance as an assistant to the director? How is it that you uh, go about your business now? Yeah. Um. So the journey is o- obviously you know you have to just if you want to become a pro- I would recommend becoming a production assistant for anyone that wants to to get into the film industry. Of course, people go to university and they go to film school and they go off to whatever and they come out with these dreams of being a director or being a producer and everyone wants to do that and of course I also want to be a producer but you have to approach it in the right way you're never going to step out of school or university or whatever and direct a Bond movie you know you're never going to (coughs) step out of university and get handed a 30 million pound film to direct because it's it's just not the reality of it so you have to go about it in the right way obviously continue to make your short films, music videos, passion projects alongside everything that you do because it's the one thing I see I've s- I've noticed throughout my you know the last however many years of working in the film industry is that people join the industry with all these this passion and ambition and to do everything and create short films and work on these big movies and do all of that and then, you know you watch the months roll by and it's hard you know it's really hard but they just give up. They don't do it. They stop. Do it. They stop making them. They stop doing all the things that give them that creative, that creativity, and that uh, uh, that chance to show the world that they can direct and they can produce. Because ultimately, doing those things is the only way that you can prove to someone. You know, me making my short films. No one's gonna believe that I can be a producer. I've never produced anything. You know, and even if it's something for fifty quid, you know, you've taken a camera out and you've gone down down to the park and you filmed something. You know, just just keep doing stuff like that, and little by little, it will grow into something that you could never even have imagined. You just keep, you know, the first thing I shot was on a tiny Sony Ericsson um, red, you know, brick camera in my bedroom, and now I get to work with Panavision equipment for Crunch Tomatoes and shoot films all up and down the country. You know, I, I never would have thought that that was something I could do, but you know, you just got to start somewhere, and so. I I became a production. I I went out and got a whole load of little bits of work experience. I did days while I was at school. You know, one day here, one day there. Being a bit, you got to, you know, you're going to go and work in a creative industry. You've got to be a bit creative. You've got to go and think outside the box. So I used to write letters, handwritten letters to people, rather than sending emails, because the letter would land on their desk and it would sit there and it'd be the only letter they got that week. Whereas they'd get 100, 200 emails a day asking for work experience. So that's how I got my work experience I used to write people letters and they used to read them they'd call me up give me a day here give me a day there I walked down to my local hotel that had just set up and said oh you know you thinking about filming a corporate video or a little advert about the hotel if you are let me know and I'd love to come down and just be an extra free pair of hands for a couple of days or however long it is and I'll do it and you know a couple of weeks later they said actually we are going to make a, a video and I went down as a sort of camera assistant uncredited but was helping with the lenses and just moving stuff around just getting experience hands-on experience putting it on my cv getting little you know little bits here and there takes a long time to build all that up which meant when you left school you were able to walk into I yeah said walk, walk into is the wrong phrase but you go on something like king arthur and it gets you bigger was the, it leavesden a couple of bigger. weeks at leavesden you did didn't you and then you yeah. wrote in and then they offered you a job yeah so one of my w- I, lo- I wrote a letter to tim bevan at working title and he you know thank thankfully he he got back to me and i got a week's worth of work experience at working title i was delivering mail i was getting lunches i was you know doing these things that sound really rubbish but it was fascinating mail room that's where everyone starts well, it was it? fascinating yeah. because because not only was i sort of delivering all these 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 you know basically dvds of films unreleased films around london when i got back to the to the production company i got to sit at a desk and i'd read the scripts that they were developing um while while waiting for the next film to deliver and i got to see london i got to see warner brothers delaine lee i got to see where everything was um so it was that was crucial but those sort of that you can see how sort of 
the, the little adverts and the little tiny hotel things build up and then suddenly you get a week's worth of something working title and then I wrote to um, one of the studios Leaveston um, and just said look I've been doing all this stuff and I'm really interested in it I'm <coughs> studying film at university um, can I get a bit of experience and they were like yeah of course you know we can't offer you anything on a production we can't offer you anything but come and do some sales and come and work in sales and operations and and um, that basically meant um, selling the studio space, so offices, stages, and uh, you know, ground rental on on workshops and car parks and just basically studio day to day you know, running. I was only there for a week, but it got a massive insight on in on how a studio works and what a studio looks like from the inside. And through that one week, I met someone who was amazing and I thank them forever Yun she was brilliant um offered to look at my CV help me out out a bit and I just she sent it around to a couple of people you know and and one thing led to another I got offered um an interview on King Arthur and I drove you know my little rubbish car across from Cheltenham where I was living at the time all the way to East London to, e- to Ealing Studios um, West London West London I think it is sorry okay we'll, we'll cut that <laughs> 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 the guy at Ealing's yeah. watching that and who is that guy? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> get him out of here. Wait, he's, he's, that's he's why I didn't get yeah. the interview. I was yeah. on the wrong side. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. that's why I got the job. I yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually a completely different yeah. interview. <laughs> um, oh dear. Thing, yeah. yeah, so then I turned up there and I got the I got the inter- I did the interview and I got the got the job. Um and then that was sort of the start of it all. And like you know, l- like we talked about earlier, I then went on and sort of did some body doubling uh, on that, and was a production assistant. And I made so much tea and coffee, you know. Although I was a production assistant, the production assistant. How does Guy Ritchie like his tea or coffee? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go- you can't tell NDA. Yeah, you yeah, can't tell us. You can't tell us. That's under wraps. That is secret. But it is strange the stuff you remember about people. You know, I remember visual effects producer, well, a visual effects producer that I worked with on. You know, on a film, and I remember exactly how she'd like her tea. And so, I to this day, I could put if she turned up here right now, I'd be able to make her tea exactly how she wanted it. Um, and another UPM's coffee I could do, but you know, it's just you know, th- although I was a production assistant, uh, the umbrella of a production assistant encompasses so much. You know, your first job, you'll be a production assistant, but you will be making tea and coffee, and that's basically what you will do. And you'll make you'll do paperwork. But for that amount of people, that's a big job. Oh, when I've yeah. been on jobs, it's like you get not you know here's your tea, here's your dinner, or dinner's over here, and they take you to places to and fro. Like sometimes you have to walk people like ten, ten, ten feet, don't they? Yeah. From the, from the set, from their trailer, and things like that. So you're and your hours are incredible, aren't they? You, yeah, t- yeah. you told me before like sixteen hour days. Yeah, plus. the hours get long. Um, What's the longest day you've done? Uh, oh. Well, short on short projects, I've I've pushed sort of twenty to twenty one hours, and on feature films you know you can easily do 16 hours it's, you know 12 is is a standard mm-hmm. day that's a short day and is that from waking up or is that from turning up on set that's turning up on on set crikey mm. yeah same for actors 12 hours except we we set our trailer for like 11 hours yeah like so it's, it's i mean it's intense and that that is you know what a lot of people you know it's 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 hollywood to a lot of people it's glamorous it's 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 you know this this industry that's untouchable but what I think people, lots of people join the industry thinking it's going to be glitz and glam, it's going to be amazing, but actually it's really it's hard. Really yeah, hard. And you're in a field yeah. at 5 a.m. and yeah. it's raining it's and you're pouring. doing a battle scene or something. Yeah. It's freezing cold. Yeah. It's and you can't be miserable rain. because everyone else is miserable. And yeah, it's just we're not all in work. the same situation. Yeah. So you know, get on with it or get out. You yeah. Know? That's some someone told me once that there's a hundred other people standing right behind me, and the moment that I, you know take my foot off the gas or 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 want to step aside someone will be in my place you know straight away Mm. so either get on with it or go and find something else Mm. and on whether you're on set or on location for example you probably are at pinewood quite a lot for bond yeah um would the hours differ there so on location you might have only x amount of time to do it or will a bond film go we can film here as long as we want because we're bond and they'll, they'll allow us i think every film you know different scenes require different amounts of work so there are certain days where you will be on set, you know, and and it it really it really just depends. Like there's nothing, there's no set rule. Sometimes you have to shoot longer because you're not going to come back to that location the next day, so you just have to carry on. You might be in a sound stage, and so you don't have to worry about the daylight or the sunlight or whatever. You can just shoot and shoot and shoot. 
um, you're not going to come back. So you either basically the, the decision has to be made then by the producers and the UPM. Do we spend the money on the overtime or do we spend the money bringing the whole crew back for an extra day? You, sorry, just to interrupt there. You, you said UPM a couple of times. What does that sound Unit for? production manager. Okay. So that's sort of the go between, between the, the person who is between the producer and the production office. So they'll do a lot of the sort of budget looking at and just making sure that we're on target um, and dealing with you know overtime, should we go into overtime, should we not? And, and <coughs> they've got a very close relationship with the producer. So yeah. sort of doing all that stuff. So yeah, then it's the decision, do you go into five hours of overtime or do you um, call everyone back for an extra day? And those decisions will have financial implications. So. Um, and but sometimes you you know you might have a if you're shooting night shoots in the summer obviously you've got a shorter amount of you know nighttime darkness so you're s- very st- you're strictly governed by the weather at that point so mm. you can only shoot for a certain x number of hours um, which means sometimes you end up with a shorter day because you you just can't shoot anymore. When a budget is given, so it's say three hundred million for say Bond, I don't know. Was that how, how much was the new Bond? Can you not say? Don't know. Do you don't know? Um, does that encompass all the actors' money as well? Again, I I, I don't know. Because um, when they say the Avengers was three hundred million, or like Robert Downey Jr. got paid like seventy five million, so surely that's not almost a third of the budget just for him. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I know that they don't include um, distribution and publicity. Yeah, that's, that's a, a lot. That's a separate. That's a separate yeah, that's marketing. Ex- no, budget. that's a huge amount of they money. They say you should half the budget, and then that's what it is basically for distribution and marketing. Really? And so if you've got a four hundred million dollar movie, you're you're going to spend an extra two hundred million. Well, I mean, you still see on London buses occasionally like Avengers Endgame going across. And yeah. I don't know whether that's due to laziness or they're still a bit of money. Yeah, just yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, they, that film's made so much money. So, um, but yeah, so I, I don't know whether or not the actors' salaries are included in that. But I mean. Yeah, salaries is a big part of the expenditure, not just for for actors, but for everyone. You know, that's uh, so many people. I'm sure you've stayed and watched the credits at the end of a movie. There are just so many people, and if you think how much that you know is being paid towards those people, you can probably quickly see how a budget might be eaten up just on on just on wages. Yeah, yeah, even, yeah, yeah. On, even on an advert before I did you've even turned to the camera. That's right. And the advert I did recently that was just for Renault, 45 seconds. It was. Mm. A day to shut the street was like eighty thousand euros or something. That's just shut the street and we're there for a yeah. week. Yeah. And then there's all the production, there's the actors and and the you know the the crew and everything like that. So it's people a logistical are like, oh. nightmare. Then people say, oh, Bond costs this much. I'm like, yeah. Do you know how many people it costs? And uh, but then at the same time, it creates a lot of jobs. People, yeah. you know, people always say, oh, you know, films a lot. Do of we money. need these movies? You yeah. Know, and it's like it creates. So I mean, think how many jobs are at Marvel or something like or at Pinewood. Oh yeah. It's a huge place, and you know. Uh, so many cogs in such a large wheel yeah. you know it, it's we a big are, industry the industry the industry film film tv industry employs so many people in the uk we are a massive you know money earner for the uk you know we go out and spend money on locations on ev- you know everything you can imagine we we're impr- you know, even just around the corner here in soho we, you know we we have so many post production houses and there's a there's a brilliant tax break for us here so n- so now most of the films that you see in the cinema will have been shot in Ivor and Watford, but not Hollywood. You know, yeah. Hollywood doesn't. It's y- it doesn't make those big movies anymore because it's so much more expensive to be made over there. Yeah. So everything gets shot here, and that means you know we have a massive inward investment and huge numbers of people employed. You know, thousands of people per movie, and if that all went away, you know that would be really bad. Mm. Yeah, and and the uh, um, Warner Brothers own Leavesden, right? Yeah. So everything that filmed there is just a Warner Brothers production because I know some of the bonds in the past have been filmed yeah, there when Pinewood hasn't been available. It's like bits Golden of leeway because I mean the the industry is so busy <coughs> at the moment that there aren't enough stages really for everything. You you see that obviously Pinewood have just had that new extension yeah. put on on their studio and Shepperton are getting a big upgrade and and Ealing are getting more stages. Um, uh, Ealing went, went very quiet for a time. Yeah. Didn't what it? and what's that? Um, oh, I can't remember the studio. I think it was even. You give us a name. I it's out west. I know the one you're talking about. What's the one? No, it's the one where, I sh- where we did shoot King Arthur for a bit with the George Lucas stage. So, just spin that round. Like when you've got your uh, movies and they're finished, um, they're, fi- they're they're finished filming. Like, how much is actually when you actually see the final products? How much is actually left of it? Would you say that it differs from movie to movie, or generally 
would you say that there's that movie another two or three times at the end of it? Yeah, I mean, there's a huge amount that ends up on the on the cutting room floor. Um, if you think, you know, even for Do No Harm, we shot uh, four days uh, and we shot a huge amount of footage mm -hmm. for those days, you know, hours and hours and hours. And if you think that, w you know, 12 minutes and 53 seconds was the final product, we probably came away with two to three days worth of footage, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and that's just for a four day shoot. Um, you know, and it's, it's take after take after take after take after take. That's what really adds the, the, the footage on. You know, we might, for, for big movies, you might sh be shooting for something that's going to last 10 seconds on screen, but you might shoot for four or five days to get it right mm. um, and to get the different angles and blah, 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 blah. Um, so you can see how it quickly builds up. I remember a shot we did for the end of Do No Harm where my eyes, I just look up. And I remember setting that shot up and it was really, really late at the end of the day. It took about 45 minutes just to reverse it, move everything around. And I see it now and every time I see it, I'm like, man, that took a lot of time. And yeah. I tell people, like, you don't appreciate how much work went into that. Yeah, and I, I mean, just did this. At every but everyone stage. else did everything, you know, worked out the and the focus pull and everything. So it's a lot of... And we were shooting on digital, so we had the luxury of you can do that. Yeah. But on film, it's something... I mean, that would cost a huge yeah, amount of money. Expensive. Yeah, film is expensive. What and are your opinions on film and digital? Uh... I th you know, I get Sam, the amazing director Sam that I work with on Crunch for Crunch Tomatoes. He and our DOP Aaron, they're those guys are very keen to shoot a shoot a film based project at some point. So we did some tests at a time. Yeah, we shot. We've done some film tests before, and that was for you wouldn't want me. This is a, a music video we've shot for an artist called Dee Dee Benz, and we went down to Cornwall. But as a producer, I look at it in a probably a different way to the way that you know top and a director would look at it but i do like what it th the way it looks but for me though at this stage when we are shooting things on a shoestring well for one we don't have enough money for it anyway it costs you know it would cost thousands of pounds to shoot something on film just just that and that would be our budget gone already without hiring anything else but um, and two, you know, we were going to go. We're going down to Cornwall, or if we go away from a from a, the camera houses, Panavision, and and something happens, you know, we break a camera because they they do get jammed, and you really have to be careful with them. Um, then we that's it. That's a wrap, guys. You know, we can't shoot for the rest of the two days, or we drop a we drop a um, a roll of film, and it's all exposed, and that's and immediately you can't that's a day it. and a half worth of film that you know that we've shot, and we've just exposed it, and we have to reshoot all that. I remember when they, I was reading about Bond film back in the 70s, going through airport x-rays. Yeah. They'd be like arguing, saying we're not going to take this. Go no, the that's right. Yeah. yeah. So, it w yeah, I've been a rushes runner. I took some rushes out um, to the Canary Islands and brought them back. Um, and yeah, you have to, you just cannot let that out of your sight. You can't get it to let it to go through the, the x-rays because it will ruin the film. And can you imagine trying to explain to a producer as a yeah. Russian runner that you've just... You know that thing that you've spent ages getting right? Millions of yeah, pounds. I got it wrong because I'm really sorry. I stuck it through an x-ray. Yeah. Machine. I'm really sorry. That conversation would be probably quite hard to have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you find it, you're fired so fast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if you're looking for another job. Yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's, it's the film would be lovely, but you know, there's also this... You know, I'm probably going to get shot for this, but... You know, there is there is a lot you can do with digital footage to make it look like film, mm. um, and so when you weigh up the 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 pros and the cons as someone that's a low budget filmmaker, it's you know low budget filmmaker but trying to to make professional films, um, it's just not worth the risk at this point. You know, maybe of one course, day, yeah, maybe absolutely. One day. I mean, I don't know when Sam was talking to Sam about each. I mean, it's 24 frames per second generally. He was saying it was like 20p per, per frame yeah, to develop something ridiculous, something something ridiculously expensive like yeah. that. And, and that is even on a short film, that is colossal money. Yeah. And especially if you're doing take after take, that's a lot. Yeah, you want the flexibility at this stage, don't you, to to be able to shoot a bit more than you need and to and to make mistakes and underexpose it a bit, you know, or, or you know stuff you can fix in post. Um, because you don't get everything right 100% of the time. And if you don't get it right on film, you don't get it right and you can't use it. And so that would that would close a lot of doors. Tarantino is quite big into filming on film as well. Yeah, I mean, it? a lot of them are, aren't they? Most of them. Yeah, we shot Bond on film. We shot Wonder Woman 84 on film. You know, um, what was that, 35mm or 70? Yeah, well, all, all ranges. Oh, okay, IMAX, 35mm, yeah. 75mm. Uh, you know, we have all the different different types and the different cameras. 
um and it's just an ex it's just it's just a lot of work and you have to, you know we have we i remember prepping to go out to um the where were we going i think canary islands on or budapest on one dormant and we had to our production coordinator had to calculate how much film we'd been using for the last you know month or so in order to order the correct amount to take out to Budapest because it if we'd obviously run out while we were out there that's a that's a nightmare that's a nightmare yeah. you know you can't and it takes a while to get you know there's not many ca- camera houses left or you know film pro- you know real film producing houses left in the UK you know that actually make it so when you've got big films like that with a huge demand for film, they're really stretched. So it can take them a couple of weeks to make it. So if you get the calculations wrong and, and you don't take enough film with you, you know, explain that to the director. One week l- left of filming. Sorry, we don't have any film. Disaster. That's oh. crazy. Good. Louis, before we end, yep. we have to ask you this question. What is a film that you're ashamed that you haven't seen? Ashamed that I haven't seen... Actually, that kind of rolls into a question I was going to ask before. Are there any films that you've worked on that you then haven't gone to watch? Or have you watched everything you've worked on? So far, I've watched everything yeah. that I've worked on. And how has that affected kind of your view, like your your experience of being on set and then watching it? Does that... Yeah, it changes it massively. I mean, yeah. even just from getting in, even just from working in the film industry, I'm sure everyone has the same. They, they look at and watch a film in a completely different light. You know, I'm watching it for... Or I wonder how they achieved that shot, or that looks like a really tricky location, or I wonder how much that costs, or that's green screen, you know, that's this, or you know, all of these questions that fly through your mind that you Mm. wouldn't have if you weren't a filmmaker. Um, Or you watch the movies that you're on, and you go, "That was such a miserable day." Exactly. Yeah, I remember that day. That that. was (laughs) awful. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Then there, there are so many little (laughs) stories like that. You you can watch a film and think. Oh God! I remember being there. We were in a, you know, we were in an absolute mud hole. You know, like such and such was screaming the head off, and yeah. nobody was happy. Yeah, but or we'd just been out the night before and had a great night, and, and we, we all had really a little good bit hungover. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, okay, that's cool. Um, but yes, back to our original question. So, um, is there a film that you feel ashamed that you haven't watched, or when someone goes, uh, "Oh, have you seen such and such?" and you're just like, "No." Yes, there is. I think it's probably Rocky. I haven't really, seen really, yeah, and really? I've, I've, I've been. It's been on my. It's actually quite annoying. You've asked me that because it's been. It, I've been trying to watch it for the last couple of weeks, but just haven't had a chance to sit down and mm. see it yet. So I'm going to uh, own up to that one now and say Rocky. <laughs> Definitely. Enough. Next time you come on, you can say that you've watched it and we'll yeah. discuss oh, it. Oh, I haven't seen it for a long time. It's but a yeah. great film. Yeah. Uh, I got a bit. I was talking to somebody about it the other day, um, and I got the ending bit wrong because I said that. Uh, Don't tell anyone. Uh, for the people who such haven't watched such it. Such and such. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> Uh, but uh, there are sequels then, just then to let you like, know. No, no, no. That's yeah. not what happens. I was like, oh god, I need to rewatch it. But it, it's fantastic. Yeah. Like okay. Sylvester Sloan smashing it there. Anyhow, I think that's all the time Louis, we've got. Thank you for your time. You're thank welcome. Superb. Thank you very I much. Hope I've been uh, absolutely. Absolutely. We've packed so much in. Thanks so Thanks much. Thanks so much, man. Thank, thank you. Very much. Cheers. Cheers.